Hi, Jeff. Welcome. Well, thank you. You could probably, he's only said one word, but you can probably tell already he's not from around here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I could almost call you an honorary Aussie. What are you up to, 30 or more trips to Australia now? I, I, not that I'm keeping count, <laughs> but uh, it's been multiple trips since uh, the first trip in May of 2009. And every, every trip I've ever made here, it's been a delight to be here. Oh, we're happy to hear that. And uh, you've been here a few days already. You've already covered some Ks. We have, we have. Um, I, I arrived on Sunday and uh, able to meet with our wonderful team uh, in Nutrient Ag Solutions here in Australia on, on Monday. And a lot of business meetings taking place, but then Tuesday and Wednesday were wonderful days. And my best day in the position I'm in are, are the days that I'm out in the network, uh, out in the countryside, out in the field with our producers and with our agros and, uh, and all the people that, that make agriculture happen. And uh, so I had two fantastic days. Great to hear. So we've impressed you so far with the hospitality this time? Always. <laughs> I'm never, dis never disappointed in that, in that area. Uh, and it, it's just been a welcoming environment for, for our organization from day one. And uh, I always look forward to my next trip, uh, next trip back to Australia. And tell us about yourself, where, you, where you're from and where you spend most of your time when you're not on a plane. Sure, uh, glad to do that. And before I do that, first of all, we're, we're tickled to be a platinum sponsor uh, of, of the Federation and of this meeting. And I also wanna, wanna thank Fiona uh, for her wonderful service to Australian agriculture. It's been my pleasure to, to get to know you and uh, work around you some, and I want to congratulate David as well on, on his appointment uh, to the Federation as well. Got the chance to meet both of them in prior trips. Actually, it's my second consecutive meeting uh, with, with the Federation. I look forward to this meeting uh, each and every year. A little bit, little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an agriculturist uh, myself. Uh, I grew up on a farm. Uh, Angie, as you mentioned, uh, I'm probably shocked everybody with the first word, with my accent, if you hadn't met me before. Uh, I grew up in Mississippi and uh, grew up on a farm in, in Mississippi, cotton, rice, soybeans, and wheat. And I've been in the business side of agriculture since 1985. Uh, those of you who've been around long enough in agriculture, you would never forget the 80s, just as I've never forgotten them. Uh, extremely difficult times. and even today when rep people reference these are tough times, I said, well, compared to what? Uh, because I desperately wanted to farm when I got out of college and uh, I didn't have that opportunity, but I took the second best opportunity. I went to work in the, in the industry of agriculture and uh, so I've got about 38 years of experience in the industry and I've done that pretty much with two organizations. Uh, I spent almost the first 12 years with BASF and then the last, uh, 26 years roughly uh, in, in the retail ag solution side of the business. Today, I have the privilege of leading our global enterprise, uh, retail enterprise within Nutrient Ag Solutions. We do business uh, extensively in the US, Canada, obviously Australia. We do business in Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile as well. And again, I consider it a privilege to work, to work in this industry. Well, 38 years and counting, you obviously made the right, the right choice. You're obviously very good at it and very happy <coughs> in the industry. We wanted to discuss uh, global supply chains with you today because I think in so many ways, the last few years have been marked by volatility and disruption. The supply chains uh, are included in that. How do you see the new world order? Yeah, and that's a question. It, it, it's no matter where I'm at and in what sector of the business, that's a question that always comes up. And... Uh, even as recently as last night, Kelly Freeman and I were meeting with the Minister of Agriculture and, uh, and was asked that very question by him as well. And, uh, you know, supply chains, particularly as they relate to agriculture, they've always been a bit elastic, yet they've also been predicated around the economy and generally are predictable. And what we've run into the last, really since 2020, uh, we're three years into it. There's so many more factors today that predicate our decisions around procurement uh, outside of just supply and demand. You know, you've got government issues, geopolitical, you've got social issues, 
you have environmental issues. And if we look at this situation we're in now, and I always tell people, don't, don't be to such a rush to change the supply chain drastically because I, I truly believe that we might have experienced four different black swan events since 2020. It, it started with the outbreak of COVID. Uh, that was a, a, a huge event, as we all know, and a lot of uncertainty when that began. Uh, we also had a massive hurricane in North America, Hurricane Ian, that hit the New Orleans area, and that's a tremendous production ground for nitrogen. And so that caused some issues uh, from a fertility standpoint, supply demand situation. There was a freeze, uh, a very late freeze in the Houston, Texas area. And I know a lot of people are wondering, well, what does a freeze in Houston have to do with supply chain? Well, when you've already got these other issues and then you, you have these issues that follow, they just compound things. So a lot of inert ingredients that go into crop protection are produced uh, in that area. And then last, but certainly not least, you know, the war in the Ukraine, just when it felt like things maybe were getting back on track again, we, we've had that occur. And then again, you know, in the last three weeks, we've had the conflict in the Middle East. And so these are events that are really unpredicated. There's really no history you go back on uh, to pull from it. And for us, we invest tremendously in our supply chain at, at Nutri and Nutri and Ag Solutions. Uh, we're back integrated as well with the world's largest producer of potash. We're the world's third largest producer of nitrogen. We produce phosphate as well. And so we can't operate, we can't exist without, without a tremendous financial investment in the supply chain. And so we've been investing over time. I think if we hadn't have done that, the implications would have been much more severe for our growers than than they actually were. And, and believe me, we were not perfect during that period of time. And we've learned a lot and we'll continue to invest in the supply chain. Uh, we have a capital project right now for Australia on the eastern side of the country uh, that deals with manufacturing and logistics that hopefully will make us more efficient in serving our growers. And then lastly, we have tremendously close relationships with our national and, and, uh, and, and basic manufacturers, global basic manufacturers out there. And those relationships, you pull on those relationships very keenly when these types of events occur uh, with it. And so deep, deep, deep uh, relationships with our suppliers. Uh, you're constantly, it's not a point in time of investing in a supply chain. You've constantly got to be adding to that, to that supply chain and those logistics, but most importantly, you got to be able to do it efficient. We got to be able to serve our growers in an efficient manner so that they can be efficient in their practices as well, because we're all competing on a global stage today uh, in this business. Yeah, interesting. I think you can often think that it's purely economic <coughs> factors, but as we've, as we've seen in recent years, you've got social, environmental, and political <coughs> drivers that are all feeding into the decisions that you're making, and you, you've outlined some of the strategies you've implemented. How do we, um, a, as a country, get on top of the locations to invest list? Yeah, so, you know, I if I look at this, number one, the most important relationship we have in our business and what makes it tick is relationship with our producers, our farmers, our growers, whatever we tend to, to call them uh, out there. And I think that first and foremost, intense planning is required today. In other words, if everybody wants to be satisfied with where we are from a supply chain standpoint and a supply standpoint, it's gonna take much more detailed planning than we've done in the past. This planning will require communications. And the, 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 the faster we can communicate what the desires of our growers are, the better lead time we have for setting up the, the procurement strategies we have in, in obtaining the goods and services we need to be able to supply. And look, <clears throat> I've gone through many cycles in this business, and one of the cycles was just-in-time manufacturing. And, uh, I can tell you that today, you can just about throw just in time out the door. Uh, it's, it's not relevant on it. And I would like, you know, people, people think, well, 
you know, maybe we can give you a six to eight month lead time. I like to think 12 to 18 months. And I know that things change there, but there are things on the farm you're also going to do that's really not going to change from year to year. And so the better job we can do in planning, planning is one component of it, most important component of it is communicating between the farm gate and our retail offices so that we can, again, go out and be armed to procure the goods and services that we need to be able to supply this market. That, that's extremely key. And we have to have a bit of a different mindset about that. Uh, you know, we, the, again, gone are the days you just walk in the door and, and say what you want for that day. Uh, it exists in some spots, but for the most part, if we have that mindset, I think we're going to be disappointed at the end of the day. Okay. <coughs> um, the theme for the conference uh, this year is uh, leading in sustainability. How do you think we could, uh, are there steps that you think we can uh, take and address in order to uh, result in A, improved profitability for farmers, but also better environmental outcomes? Yeah, and again, that's, that's another one that's, uh, that, that word is probably one of the more popular words associated with conversations around agriculture today. Uh, one of the deficiencies I think we have is we're very consistent, we're very inconsistent in what the definition of sustainability is. You know, when I hear, I might hear it referred to as climate. Uh, I might hear it referred to as carbon. Uh, as we talk in our organization, we do talk about sustainability uh, from that standpoint. I tell you, one of the things I'm really encouraged about, uh, particularly when I'm here in Australia with the Australian grower, and we had an opportunity to sit down and visit with a large producer this week, is how well versed the Australian grower is on sustainability. And actually, if you think about it, Australian growers have been practicing sustainability for tens of years uh, here in this country. So you have a leg up here, and you have a leg up because you were required to make those decisions and adapt those, those practices as you deal with water and moisture and you deal with trying to build the profile of your soil up as well. As an industry, what we have to do is we've got to get consistent between government and the industry on how we define sustainability. Um, what are the solutions? How do we build those solutions to get the desired outcomes that we want to have? Then comes the measurement part of it. How do we measure what we actually accomplished? Last but not least, because we're changing practices to do some of this, how do we create value for the producer in this? Because nothing happens, in my opinion, in sustainability until it happens at the farm. And people can talk from 100,000 feet all they want to. But if the grower is not bought in to what the consumer wants or what the food companies want to try to achieve, you don't have anything there. And so we've got to figure out a way, again, and the measurement is a key portion of that, is how do we measure the desired outcome that we're trying to create and how do we create value for the grower? Because growers aren't going to go change a lot of practices if all it does is add cost to them and it doesn't bring any revenue in. At the same time, we're charged with doing this efficiently as possible because we're fighting food inflation today as well. So there's a lot of pieces in this that have to be connected. And I, believe me, if I'm, if I'm in North America, the pieces to connect seem even larger than they do when I'm here in Australia. I'm, uh, I'm very impressed with the growers' knowledge of, of these types of programs and, and equally impressed in what they're doing for their soil profile how conscious they are of the environment and the planet. And uh, th those are real keys. And then we got a lot, as an, as an industry, we have a lot of education to do, in, in my opinion, uh, around that. Yeah, interesting. Look, it is something that I think we are good at it. Like, as you said, it's quantifying <coughs> it that, um, that, that requires yes. a bit of work. Another theme we're uh, talking about the next couple of days is innovation. How do you see uh, the future of that and, and, and what should the focus be as we move into that digital ag space? Yeah, I'm, 
obviously I'm biased to agriculture because I've been in it all my life and I make my living at it. I think agriculture, of all the sectors of industry in the world, I think agriculture is one of the most innovative there is. And sometimes if you catch people that didn't come from, from the farm or the paddy or they, they raise their eyebrows when you make that comment, I, I don't know an industry that's accepted more technology than agriculture. And, uh, but I plead with growers and customers and with our network when I'm out that we have got to be so open to accepting this innovation because again, everything is driven around efficiency today, especially when you're competing on a global basis. Um, I get to spend a lot of time, probably more than I want to today down in Brazil because that's a, we, we've made some substantial investments in, in Brazil and in their agricultural space, and there's a lot of volatility in that market today. But one of the things when I'm out with growers in Brazil, one of the things that strikes me is how hungry they are for technology and innovation there. And because they're, you know, a lot of the growers in that country don't come from family farms. Uh, a lot of them have just gotten in agriculture in the last 10 years. And I find that a lot of times they're much more acceptable to innovation and technology. And again, we, we all compete on a, on a global basis. So I, I plead with our team and I plead with our, with our customers as well is do not ever close your ears or close the doors on innovation because if you're not innovating right now, in my opinion, you're going backwards because there are a lot of people out there that, that, that are innovating from that standpoint. And uh, look, data is key and, and data is going to be very valuable. We don't know the true extent to how valuable data is to us today. We, we know that it leads to a lot of efficiencies, but uh, it, the ability to retain this data is, is very important, and that kind of ties into the digital platform that we work so hard to create. Yeah, it does. So we, we know sustainability and innovation are, are very important going forward. If you could pick, you may have already touched on it, but one mega trend that we need to really uh, address or be aware of in order to prosper as an industry, what would it be? Well, me mega trend again is around innovation and technology. Uh, I think a mega trend going forward will be around uh, sustainability as well. And I touched on data just a minute, but uh, having, a, having a large amount of data also brings a large amount of responsibility in how do we secure that data and from a cybersecurity standpoint. And uh, look, we, we spend a lot of money and we spend a lot of brain hours every day because we don't take for granted a lot of the data that we house for our customers today in that market. So look, everywhere you go, everybody's going to want more data. The data lakes are, are getting larger and larger and larger. And with that comes a much larger responsibility as far as protecting the integrity of that data going forward. All right, Jeff Tarzi, thank you so much for your time this morning and for your insights. Thank you.